So, after so many people complained, I made a new version of Prosian with tones. Now, I know what you're thinking. Seriously, dude, that was a month ago. Get over it, and I understand your concerns. But I don't care, shut up. You're just a kid, okay? So, how? Well, Old Chinese actually looked a lot like your average Indo-European language. It had to sacrifice a lot of its complexity to create tones. To make complex tones, Prosian had to sacrifice phonemic vowel length, consonant clusters, and then all coda consonants. But that's only to produce complex tones. How did we get tones in the first place? Well, I didn't have to add them. They were already there. Because Proto-Indo-European had tones. Sort of. In English, every word has a primary stress that it places on one of its syllables, but what does that stress actually do? Well, it adds emphasis to the syllable, but emphasis is just a synonym for stress. What are your speaking parts actually doing? If you thought about it for a second, you might have come up with, it's louder. Yeah, that's true. The stress syllable serves as an anchor for the word, so it's louder to get your attention. You might have also noticed that it's longer, and this is true, but it's also an English thing. English and some other languages are considered stress-timed, where the unstressed syllables shorten to work around the stress syllables. But a lot of other languages are syllable-timed, where all syllables are the same length. And then there are more timed languages where, shockingly, longer syllables are longer. In addition to those two, you might have also noticed that the stress syllable is more clearly enunciated. This is called reduction, and it's also common. Unstressed syllables have more central vowels and therefore make fewer vowel distinctions. In my accent, a fully unstressed syllable can choose between about two different vowels. Can you think of any other languages where the stress determines how vowels are pronounced? And finally, you might have noticed a fourth thing. It's higher in pitch. This is called pitch accent, and it's a lot more complicated than just the stressed syllable is higher, but that's the most basic idea. Japanese is a good example of how complicated this can get, and we think it occurred in Proto-Indo-European, too. In all modern languages, this has either remained a feature of stress, or it's just disappeared. But what if it didn't? Rule 32. Pitch accent disengages from stress syllable. Donas, the name of the language from Proto-Indo-European, the crowd, becomes Donas. Now, as of yet, it's still coincident with the stress, but if we move the stress, as we do with rule 47, the correlation disappears. There's no way to predict where the tone falls, so it's phonemic. Rule 52, merger of non-high front vowels, the opposite of the Germanic thing, donas. Rule 55, low tone vowel changes, O stretches into wo, tonas. Rule 60, coda consonants disappear, the syllable final S disappears. Since it's a voiceless consonant, the high tone becomes high descending, tona. Rule 62 aspirates the T, and rule 64, turning wa into va and hua into fa. Tonjin, yes, that's the real name I went with, pronounces its own population as tfona. Now, ancient Greek and probably Proto-Slavic actually had something similar to this, but under the influence of the Semitic languages and Latin, it was killed off. Under the influence of Chinese languages, I would expect to see it develop into a fully-fledged seven-tone system. It kind of. You see, tone 7, the high mobile tone, only occurs in modern loanwords, and tones 3 and 5, high rising and low rising, are being merged by younger speakers, but that's not really relevant at the moment. So now, in whatever universe I've made up for this, there's two Indo-European languages in China? Well, there's seven actually, and they're all part of the Virchomenian language family, named after the Prosian word for this area foggy mountains. Prosian is the most widely spoken, one of the reasons why it's remained separate from Chinese. The other is that it was insulated from Chinese influence by the other Virhomenian languages. Tongjin is one of the less spoken, and it's spoken in Chongqing province, surrounded by Mandarin-speaking territory, although this is a relatively recent development. Those are, respectively, members of the Western and Eastern Virhomenian families. There are five more. Flosian is spoken along the Yangtze River in southern Sichuan and parts of Yunnan. Snojin is spoken in the mountainous regions in the west. It's the least spoken by far, but also the most conservative. Linguistically, I should say. Politically, they're the most liberal. You might think that doesn't matter, but this is actually in an alternate universe where China is a democracy and it's the U.S. that's authoritarian. Uh, we have a word for that. It's called the real world. That's three words. Hey, in the words of Doja Cat, let me be a Wu Mao. I think she said woman. Kill your- The Eastern Viromanian languages include Lozhin, the second largest language, spoken on the plains around Chongqing, and Grozhin, spoken in the forested regions of southern Shanxi. That leaves Nozhin, which isn't actually spoken nowadays. It's a classical language like Church Latin used to preserve the nation's greatest epic, the Kanapiyoyases, literally the Song of Walking. So, the best way to compare languages is by finding a sentence that consists entirely of cognates between all of the languages. This would be difficult, until I remember that I'm in charge of the languages so I can just decide the etymologies of every word. So the sentence I've gone with is, The river flows down the mountains to my little house. 
In every language, it's written the same using these hansa. But how are they pronounced? Now, it's not written, but Western Viromanian languages use determiners like the. The Eastern don't, and neither does Nosian. In terms of reconstructed ancestors, it's more Esperanto than PIE. To determine which determiner, we need to check the gender of the noun river. Determiners don't check for case, if you recall. The suffix I'm using to form river forms masculine nouns, so the masculine determiners are Prosian s, Snosian s, Flosian s. River is ultimately derived from Proto-Indo-European teh, meaning melt or flow. In English, it's tha. With os in the nominative, it ablotes to toahos, giving proto virhomenian taos, and prosian taha, snosian taz, flosian toas, tonjian tavo, losian tai u, grosian ta o, nosian tawos. All the Viromanian languages use the Chinese sentence order, subject, preposition, indirect object, verb. So we go ahead into down. Proto-Indo-European rarely has a word for downwards. Most languages use to the bottom, with bottom ultimately from valley, English included. But Chinese does have a preposition for subessive motion, xia. In Old Chinese, this was gra. I would insert this into Proto-Viromanian as gra, but I have no idea how to best transliterate the glottal stop. Perhaps ka or ha, but I mean, if there were really a ton of Chinese loanwords coming in at this time, it's not unreasonable that the glottal stop just became its own phoneme. So, gra. That becomes Proto-Viromanian gre, which survives as prosian gre, snosian gre, flosian gra, tonjian gra, losian gre, grosian gre, nosian gre. The word for mountain is the same one that gave us the English barrow and also the virho in Viromenian. It's a masculine noun, so we add in the determiners in the Western languages. Since it's moving down the mountain, that puts it in the locative descended from the PIE ablative. So the OG root becomes perkesos, proto virhomenian virgeses. Prosian virsheses, snosian virsheses, flosian virshosas, tonjan virise, losian virise. Grosian viri se, nosian virsises. So now we circle back to flows. Flows is formed using the same root as river, but it's in the past aorist, middle, third person singular, indicative. It's also formed using one of Proto Indo European's wacky inflection patterns, the reduplicated thematic. We've constructed a ton of these patterns, but we don't actually know when to use them or what they signify, so I'm just using this one because I want to. You take the first consonant of the root, reduplicate it, give it an E, put the root in zero grade, and then attach the thematic vowel and then the suffix for inflection. It becomes tethetor. That becomes the Proto-Viromenian titater. In order, that's prosian tseter, snosian tietater, flosian tator, tonjian tietje, losian titote, grosian titote, nosian titeter. There are a lot of options for the allative preposition, to or towards. There's de and its extension de, which gave us the modern English to. There's head, which became at in English, but to in Romance languages. There could be a semantic shift from hndo into or hepi, at or near. And then there's, of course, the complete opposite, hepo, away, if you want to try an Albanian way of doing things. I'm going with head, which becomes proto virhomenian ad. Prosian ad, snosian ad, flosian od, tonjian a, losian i, grosian a, nosian ad. The next word is my, but all the Viromanian languages like Prosian lack the genitive case. Instead, this is the two words me, z. Except, is this me? Well, the genitive was lost, but the pronoun has to be in a case. In most of them, this was the accusative, but in Grosian and Losian, it's the dative case. Now, the accusative first-person singular pronoun is me, but the dative has two forms, the tonic or stressed and the enclitic, or in normal people terms, the big one and the small one. The small one is only used in the West, but it's a reduced form that gets mangled up with the surrounding words, the sort of abusive pronouns you'd expect from a pro-drop language. The Viromenians are anything but pro-dropping. So we use the full form, meti. Those become the proto viromanian mi and mi yi, and the languages use prosian mia, snosian mia, flosian mia, tonjian mi, losian mi yu, grosian mi yu, nosian mi. Which brings us to the genitive particle itself. In prosian, the word set is from tit, a clitization or short form of proto viromanian e tu, meaning it has, from proto indo european he teti. This starting point produces the different forms prosian set, snosian chet, flosian kiat, 
Tonjin Sitan, Lojin Ruton, Grojin Hiton, Nojin Sit. Now on to the adjective. The Proto-European word for small is meios, but that word ends up as me, which I would guess to be an extremely common word. It still exists in the word for few, teme, but on its own it's been phased out and replaced by the Chinese loanword smo. If this is to be nativized, it's also going to be declined as if it were a modern adjective based on the gender and case of the house in question. The house, believe it or not, is also loaned from Chinese, so its gender is determined by its stress, making it feminine. Of course, in the Eastern languages, the masculine gender has disappeared, so the feminine form is just the form. The same is true about flosion, but for masculine, so it has two alternate inflection patterns for ablative. Smell os, the masculine, and smell yas the feminine, into smell as and smell yas. These become respectively prosian smell yas, snosian smell yas, flosian smell yes, tonesian smell ya, lojian smell ya, grosian smell ya, nosian smell yas. The Chinese word for house is fang zi, although it seems unnecessary to include the zi when its only purpose is to specify this particular use of fang. The old Chinese form of this word is famously bang, nativized as bang with the ablative declension ad. This becomes proto romanian bengd. Prosian bengard, snosian bengard, flosian bangerd, tonesian banga, lojian benga, grosian benga, nosian bengard. So, all in all, that's- I'm not doing that seven times. Take care.